ir a la deriva, perderse. But even if you're reading a science paper or a work of philosophy, you have to give yourself up to the thought of the other. El escritor no es siempre de la literatura que falta. Entonces ahora vamos atrás. ¿Me quieren hacer alguna pregunta? Okay. Un minuto para dibujar. A mí me encanta que los libros empiecen justo desde la portada. But what is the function of a novelist? I mean, maybe you can tell me. No, I have no idea. <laughs> Hay una cuestión geográfica en la circulación de la literatura, una cuestión de mapas y fronteras. Un monólogo interior no es sencillo hacer una película. It has to do with the feeling that it's truthful enough to my own experience. So clearly, they can be taught. <laughs>y bienvenidas, gracias una vez más por estar del otro lado en esta que es la última actividad de este Filba 2021. Fueron cinco días de literatura en el que creemos que pasaron cosas interesantes, hemos escuchado, nos hemos escuchado, pensamos y volvimos a leer, a pensar y a dudar, que siempre creemos que es la forma más interesante de, de leer el mundo alrededor. Eh, también fue un momento de volver a encontrarnos, encontrarnos en cuerpo presente y no solo a través de las pantallas. Y ahora es momento de, de agradecer, agradecer a todos los que nos acompañaron, al público que se sumó una vez más, a los socios, a las instituciones eh, que nos apoyan todos los años y que son los que verdaderamente hacen posible este festival, a las sedes nuevas que nos abrieron las puertas después de un año de quietud y a las verdaderas protagonistas de este festival que son los artistas, los escritores y las escritoras que generosamente se sumaron en esta edición. Protagonistas absolutos, como ahora serán en los próximos minutos, eh, la, la que posiblemente sea la pareja de escritores e intelectuales más central de la literatura contemporánea, con una presencia gravitante en el debate cultural de la actualidad que trasciende la obra de ambos, que por otro lado es extensísima y prolífica y multipremiada internacionalmente. Hablo de Paul Oster y de Siri Husbeth, un cierre de lujo soñado para este festival quienes van a conversar, creemos que por primera vez juntos en un evento de este tipo, llevados por la guía de Nicolás Artusi, periodista, lector voraz y amigo de Filba, a quien también agradecemos una vez más que sea parte de, del festival. Eh, un cierre que nos pone muy, muy contentas y por el que trabajamos muchísimo y que queremos agradecer a la Embajada de Estados Unidos que vuelve a acompañarnos y a KS Films, con quienes trabajamos juntos y con mucho placer, una vez más. Bueno, creo que ya dije todo, y lo que todos queremos ahora es escucharlos a ellos, así que los dejo, y esperamos encontrarlos de nuevo en la próxima edición. Hasta el año que viene. Muchas gracias. Hi, how are you? It's Nicolás, here from Buenos Aires. Welcome to this edition of Filba, Festival Internacional de Literatura. It's very nice to me to talk to you. It's a pleasure and an honor. So welcome. Welcome to this edition. You are uh, old friends of Buenos Aires and Filba. Yes. We are. We are. <laughs> so my first question is for Siri. Siri, just a, a year ago in this same festival, you talked about this new and strange reality. So one year, one year later, how do you feel about it? Well, I'm vaccinated now. Um, vaccines are clearly uh, a great hope uh, for the world. Uh, at the same time, we're not finished with this. And uh, I think that the ongoing lessons have to do with interconnectivity, that the human, uh, not just the human race, but All ecosystems are connected, and if we don't solve this as a global problem, we won't solve it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul, how do you feel right now? Um, I feel that um, we're living in a, a world of many disparities and contradictions. Um, whereas we all know that vaccines are the one thing that can truly end the pandemic. Uh, on the one hand, you have many countries that don't have access to vaccines. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, you have a country like the United States where we have enough for everybody 
and there's a large percentage of the population that refuses to take them for reasons that I really don't understand. Um, it's as if people are voluntarily turning themselves into potential murderers or wanting to commit suicide. I, I don't understand the logic behind it, but that's a fact in America today. And it, we're, we're moving backwards rather than forwards in, in solving the problem when the power to do it is right here in our hands now. Yeah, a potential murderer is uh, hard, very hard to hear it. Yeah, well, I think this is it. Um, in the United States, the long legacy of rugged individualism, the idea that um, every person is a monad who makes uh, his or her own decisions is very strong. It's been strong uh, uh, since the beginning of the country. And that idea of individualism is becoming confused with a public health issue, you know, to the, <laughs> to the detriment of uh, collective life. And collective life is what gets forgotten often in the United States. Uh, and now we have really two, uh, uh, two sides in a single battle. Uh, this has become deeply political and uh, we're, our democracy is hanging by a thread at the moment. So we just have to pray uh, that people who do care about collective reality uh, win the day. Mm -hmm. um, after a year and a half of pandemic, do you think that this universal experience will be a fountain of stories or on the contrary, will we need new narratives? That's a good question. Um, It's hard to say uh, because the last great pandemic a hundred years ago, um, which which was far more fatal than this one has been so far. No, no. Uh, 50 million people in the world oh, were yes, killed. Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, 50 million people. And the strange thing is that after it was over, nobody wanted to talk about it. Yeah. And there's very little literature about it. And in fact, When I grew up as a young person, even studying history, it wasn't really mentioned, only one or two sentences. Um, so I don't know how we're going to respond to this. It's too soon to say. I, I don't know. Maybe when it's over, people will do the same thing and just want to forget all about it. I think, um, actually, there are only three memorials in the world uh, to the 1918 pandemic. And in the United States, 675,000 people died during that pandemic, and we are swiftly approaching that number now. I expect that the, um, you know, 2019, 2020, uh, 2021 uh, pandemic will uh, go beyond those numbers in the United States. Uh, forgetting, Yes, um, there actually is quite a bit of scholarship on it, um, on the pandemic. You can read about it, the 1918, uh, but in the general public, it was absolutely forgotten. You know, the 1920s began, everyone was happy, the war was over, and um, they just wanted to think about other things. And um, uh, who knows, who knows? Uh, if, if we've learned anything in our long lives so far is that Human beings are unpredictable, and I, I wouldn't want to make a, a forecast about what will happen in the future. Yeah, I think we are exhausted, so we'll need new <laughs> stories, new characters, eh? new, new uh, pandemics So really? yeah. for the fiction. So it, it's a frequent topic in cultural, in cultural studies, the connection between uh, reality and fiction and fiction and reality and how sometimes really it's uh, reality it's stranger than fiction than <laughs> fiction it's a new challenge for literature this pandemic or or no well as i say i don't know if writers are going to want to take it up when you when you think about your own private life whenever you've been sick say you had the flu or pneumonia and then you're finally better, you really don't think about it anymore. <laughs> you get up yeah. and start living your life again. And uh, I just, 
again, I, I, I don't want to be repetitive, but I, I don't know if literature is going to take this well, on. Well, I can or say not. I plan to put the pandemic in my next novel. Well, good. So, <laughs> so there's one there's one writer um, who has a plan. Now plans can always change, so it's a little risky to advertise what you intend to do, and then it turns out it doesn't fit. Uh, you know, in the story you end up writing. But um, I think mostly uh, events like this uh, do appear in literature after they're, they're over, you know? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you have to remember that, um, you know, the great novel of the Napoleonic invasion of Russia was written by Tolstoy in 1870, you know, almost 1870, about 50 something years after the events. Yeah. yeah. I think it takes a long time for um, uh, real fiction to, to emerge from, from historical events. Right. Because we're, we're still assimilating it. Uh, reported, sure. Journalism, fine. Editorials about what's going on. Yes, of course. Lots of words. But actually, Creative fiction? I don't know. I, I really, I really can't say. Yeah, we need, I think, um, historical perspective. Yeah, I think so. Um, and so often, there's a lot of looking back in literary works. You know, yeah. back to often periods before a writer was even born, or the period of a writer's childhood. Um, this happens frequently. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anxiety is the main topic uh, in this edition of Philba. So, how do you manage anxiety at the time of writing in this context? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I have to say, when the pandemic hit, I really did feel, um, I did feel extra anxiety. And I ended up revising essays for a book, um, writing a lot of essays about politics and about the pandemic. Uh, it, I was unable to write fiction. Yes, and I myself have, have just started writing fiction again. I, I've been working on some uh, nonfiction projects. They're, they're done, finally, just recently done. And I'm, I'm, I'm back, I'm writing short stories now. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing that. And, uh, but nothing set in the pandemic, not yet anyway. Um, um, so I, I felt um, on the one hand um, that I had to continue and push on with my work, but I didn't feel um, inspired to, to start another piece of fiction yet until now, until now. Um, but that's just idiosyncratic. I, I wouldn't want to make any Actually, kind of no, uh, but I did hear about other about writers who had a lot of trouble embarking on fiction, and I'm sure this is not by any means true of, of everyone. I, I, I'm sure no, there's going to be all. a lot of great no, fiction of written course. during this period, but but I have heard of other writers who had the same response. So um, uh, how is the, the process of uh, starting thinking your stories and characters in regular times? Uh, well, it, it, uh, it, it depends. Usually uh, with my novels, it's taken most of the time years of gestation before I'm ready yeah. to write it. Um, I don't go out looking for stories. They kind of find me. It's usually um, a character or a set of characters who begin to develop in my head. Um, and often I, I don't really want to think about them. But if they keep coming back and telling me that, no, I'm important. You want to you talk about me. You want to try to understand me. Then I get interested, and then and then I begin to explore it more. Um, but it's a very very strange process, and I, I can't really define how how it works. Then, you know, I get an idea to begin, and um, and I think I might have a plan for the book in my head or a vague plan, but it always changes. Once I start writing, 
new things begin to happen. And uh, it's in the act of doing it that you actually right. make it. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's really hard to talk about it. You, you can say, well, here it is, it's finished. For better or for worse, I did what I could and I can't do anymore, so it's finished. And then there's a, a feeling of exaltation for about 35 seconds. And then, boom, you look at it again and you say, I spent all these years writing this, <laughs> this failure, this piece of garbage that I've spent all my blood and guts I, with. I call it the disgust phase. The disgust phase, yes. <laughs> yes. It's like, oh no, it's, it's, and it happens. This phase again, no. <laughs> but, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a great line in, in one of Beckett's stories. He says, no sooner is the ink dry than it disgusts me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there is the disgust phase. I have to, I and I know, uh, unless Paul is is going to prevaricate, uh, it it goes away. You, you're not completely disgusted. Sometimes, um, and I know this has happened to him too, that you have to return to an old book for some reason, and you go, "Gee, I wrote that." <laughs> yeah. And then like you... it's so gee how did i do that you know it's a kind of so the disgust phase is there it doesn't last forever um i can say sometimes i've had books that just start with a picture in my mind a, an image and that image keeps coming back by the time the book is finished the prompting image can be very um in some way remote, but you can still feel what the seeds were that fed the narrative. Uh, for example, um, before I was started writing what I loved, I had this image of an enormously fat woman lying in a bed, dead. And I go, what is this? Well, I had a painter who painted people really fat and really thin. And there's death, of course, and somehow those themes came out in, in the book that I ended up writing. Yeah, I can remember one of my books, uh, a short book called Travels in the Scriptorium. Oh, right. Yeah. I, that, that was the only book of mine that started with a picture. And I saw an old man in his pajamas, striped pajamas with slippers on his feet, sitting at the at the edge of a bed, bed. With, with his with his hands on his knees looking down at the floor i it just kept seeing this picture i just kept seeing it and kept seeing it and then after a while i i i i thought i mean i was never certain that i was actually making a picture of myself as a very old man and somehow out of this this strange little book uh, developed. Um, it's all very strange. Um, I, I, I have to say that the most important line in a book is the first sentence, the first thing. And, and I often can spend months thinking about how to get into the story. And there are a lot of false starts. And then uh, the beginning of a book or anything, it's always the beginning that's the hardest. Yeah. It takes me the longest. I mean, I'm working on something now, mm -hmm. and I've spent a week and a half writing four paragraphs. I just keep going over and over and over them. Uh, and it has to be good enough so that I can feel that it's going to propel me into the rest. It's it, Again, it's all very strange. and And this is my problem or my way of doing things. I'm sure other writers go about it in a completely different way. I don't know. <clears throat> and what is your uh, favorite first sentence on history of literature? Oh. That's a good question. There's some really famous ones, aren't there? Well, I mean, there's the there's great the, Melville, that. Call Me Ishmael. I mean, yeah. that's pretty, pretty that's fantastic. <laughs> All Sorry, Angela, yeah. like, not true, but <laughs> a great first sentence. Or that, that first line in Ulysses, stately plump 
stock mulligan. And then, and yeah, was, yeah. You know, Another one is uh, Lolita, light of my life. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fire of yes. my loins. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. um, look at this, Paul. I have this beautiful edition of New York Trilo Trilogy. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, hardcover, full of illustrations. It's a treasure for me. Folio of society, right? That's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a, a beautiful object. So how is New York City right now? Because for many of us, you, Siri, and you, Paul, are uh, uh, synonymous of New York City. Um, well, the fact is, we haven't been out that much. No. Um, uh, my feeling is that New York um, is in, in a... There, there Again, there are many, many contradictions. Uh, I've admired uh, the spirit of New Yorkers in general about how they've handled this. I think um, there's, there's, you know, a, a, a tremendous number of people have been vaccinated um, and, and people are uh, following the rules that have been set down because they're, 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 they're grownups. They're not children the way so many other people are. At the same time, there have been many horrible consequences of this period. And one of the worst is an enormous increase in gun violence in New York City. Yeah. Um, uh, the number of shootings between May of 2020 and May of 2021 increased 70%, which is astonishing. Uh, and people are not just in New York, but all over the country, they're buying guns. I, I think people are, are, are in a kind of paranoia uh, fever right. this is, about, I, I, about the dangers uh, surrounding them. Right. Well, this is a mingling of pandemic and political reality. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think that's important, yes, too. Yes, definitely. And also, you know, one of the uh, major, uh, you know, revelations, at least for some people, was the degree to which the pandemic exposed inequality uh, in the United States, but also in New York City. You know, people with, many people with money just left town. They went to their country houses, stayed away. Uh, it was, you know, ordinary workers who became essential workers in grocery stores and delivering the mail, doing all the various uh, important tasks that support the city. And um, they, of course, died at higher rates as well. So um, this uh, really stark inequality in the culture and in the city uh, was you know, was, I think, uh, also created anxiety and depression and unhappiness, mm -hmm. yeah. right? But the, the poor and the struggling are always going to get the worst of it, always. And if you're poor and struggling and black, you're, you're really having a harder time of, of it for, in the most, for the most part than, ev than everyone else, the white struggling people. I mean, there are hierarchies of, of, of difficulty. Um, but the rich always seem to get away with it, you know? Um, um, and we have such horrible disparity in income now. I mean, the gap between the rich and the poor is larger than it's been in 120 or 30 years in the United States. We, we're socially, we're a country going backwards um, and it's, 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 it's uh, frightening. We're going forward in some ways but backwards in, in many of the most essential ways. And um, uh, that's why Siri said, you know, democracy is hanging by a thread now, but the whole, the whole uh, system is, 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 is vulnerable now because it has so many flaws and inequities in it. And, um, and it's very hard given the political system in this country to change anything. Um, we have structural impediments built into the very form of the government that make it very hard. Um, you know, things like the Electoral College, where you get presidents elected who lost. Yes. You know, and I'm thinking about right. George wow. W. Bush and Donald Trump. Yeah. They were not elected by a majority of the people mm -hmm. but because of this crazy system we have of choosing presidents. The Senate, another example 
which is you know the most important uh, legislative body we have in the country, um, two senators from each state. Well, California has 40 million people. Wyoming has 500,000 people. They each have two senators, meaning that a vote in Wyoming is worth 80 times what a vote in, in, in California is worth. So what we get constantly in the history of this country, and there are other things too, I won't you know, bore you with the whole list of these impediments, but what we get is minority rule in the country. And, um, and so it's always held us back. This minority rule is what perpetuated slavery. It led to the Civil War in the 19th century. And minority rule is holding us back from fixing all the problems that everyone knows are there in contemporary society. That's what's so frustrating to me, is that it's hard to do anything. Because yeah, with a filibuster in the Senate, 41 <laughs> can block 59. Yeah. We, and we, and it's a, uh, it's very <clears> tough. <throat> in these times, I think uh, New York City is like a dictionary definition of gentrification. Uh, so do you agree with this idea? Well, you know, New York, since I moved to New York in 1978, so it's, you know, mm -hmm. over 40 years, um, one truth is that the city never stops changing and neighborhoods are continually going through these changes. Now, I think gentrification is something that um, needs, you know, people need protection from too much of it, right? But it is impossible to stop a city in its tracks. There are European cities. Um, Paris, for example, changes much less swiftly than New York City. There's something about New York, it's just, it's a chameleon. Um, and neighborhoods go through all kinds of different phases, often that have to do with money coming in or money going out. Yeah, I mean, Harlem, you know, the most famous, uh, uh, ex uh, predominantly black neighborhood in Manhattan, you know, started out as a white neighborhood many years ago, and then it changed. And now white people are moving back into Harlem. Uh, is this a bad thing or a good thing? I don't know. It's just, it's just the evolution of, of the city. I, I can't make moral judgments about it. It's, um, it's so complicated, uh, you know, so, so, and sometimes, you know, these gentrification uh, uh, changes have vastly improved neighborhoods that were crumbling. Yeah. And yeah. then people buy up buildings for not much money and they restore them and they make the neighborhood better. Um, but then again, um, you know, it, the, the poor need better housing. We don't have it here. So it, there are problems no matter which direction you turn in and no easy solutions. Yeah, yeah, I think the problem is when uh, gentrification creates cities for rich people only. So like San Francisco right now. Yeah, yeah, San Francisco or, um, no, there's a, there's a whole, Manhattan really mm -hmm. became a place for people with money to a large degree yeah. now. And it didn't used to be. It certainly wasn't when I first moved to New York. Um, you could still be poor, as I was, a poor student, and <laughs> stumble along. Uh, you know, the rents were not sky high. And when I met Paul and we moved in together, he was living in Brooklyn because of the prices. So that's how I got to Brooklyn. You know, I moved up I moved in with a man who was living there. Yeah, and I had, yeah, I had, I just couldn't afford to live in Manhattan anymore back then. Yeah. Uh, so I came here. I'm happy I did, but at the time it seemed very depressing that I had to leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right Manhattan, is, Manhattan is the Dubai of North America, they say. Oh, right. What, what is the Dubai? Dubai, of Dubai, Dubai of North America. What, Manhattan. Yeah, Arabic Emirates. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for shakes, only for shakes. <laughs> yeah. see, New York, Manhattan used to be a very working class place. Yeah. Uh, what happened in New York, it's, it's sad. The biggest industry in New York was the garment industry. All the clothes 
in America were made here, and there were tens of thousands of garment workers. Well, a bit by bit, all the business and manufacturing moved abroad. Yeah. So I read, um, Siri and I saw a wonderful documentary a few years ago about right. this. Um, and it was in 1960, 95% of all the clothes worn by Americans were made in America. By 2000, 5%. It's quite a shift, huh? Yeah, yeah. So in your books, both of you about a city, New York City, of course, that has vanished or disappeared. Is this kind of feeling uh, even harder after the pandemic? I, I have a feeling that New York is going to change again, you know, yet again, that we'll be looking at um, um, another place, different work rules. There's, there's speculation that um, there won't be as many office buildings or that office buildings will be turned into something else um, because of changes after the pandemic, um, you know, in, in how people work. Uh, we don't know yet. No. I, I don't think mm. we know. It, it might not be the case, but there's certainly speculation about that now. Mm -hmm. So uh, talking about uh, anxiety uh, of um, these times or pandemic, I think um, it's a problem of our age, the anxiety and madness and control madness. So my question is, is it necessary for a writer to have a little piece of strangeness or even madness? <laughs> You're asking a person who's thought a lot about this. I think, you know, um, I have a, a, a job. I give a seminar in, in narrative psychiatry um, to psychiatric residents. And I think actually this is a myth um, that the, I, the idea that you have to be crazy to be creative <laughs> probably does more harm than good. Um, and when I was teaching writing to psych psychiatric patients, um, it was quite clear to me that usually um, mental illness uh, makes it harder to be creative, that it stymies creative processes because it makes you unfree in fundamental ways. The other point, however, is that there does seem to be a connection between what used to be called manic depression and is now called bipolar disorder um, and highly creative poets, especially poets. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and no one exactly understands. There's lots of theories about why that might be, but no one has the answer. No, no. I just think that writers come in all, and artists in general come in all kinds. Um, all backgrounds, all uh, mental conditions. Um, yeah, you have crazy people who are great artists, but then you have a lot of very sane people who are great artists too. Um, there are no rules about any of this. Um, I, I just, when people make blanket statements about things, um, it's not interesting because it's never true. <laughs> 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 so, uh, talking about creative process, Paul, uh, are you still a pen and paper man? Yes, yes. Yeah. I still write by hand. And um, it's just because I, I like it. I like to feel the, 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 the contact with the page and my hand. And then I type it up on my old typewriter every day. And um, the only difference now is that I have to give it to someone to type into a computer. Uh, before I hand it into the publisher, yeah. but so what? It's not. It's not such a big sacrifice, um, and uh, that's it. I I know I'm a dinosaur, but I, I just feel very comfortable working this way, and uh, it doesn't doesn't matter to me. Um, why change it? Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, just for a texture, or um, it's for um, speed. Speed of thoughts on no, it's the just, writing I, process. I've never been able to compose with my hands on a keyboard, even a typewriter in the old days. I somehow need the pencil or pen in my hand, pressing on the page to think and to and to summon the words. This is an idiosyncratic twick, uh, tick of mine. It, it doesn't, hmm. I don't know what it means, but I don't feel comfortable writing on a keyboard. Other, I, Siri loves it. No, so this yeah. is 
I think Paul likes the idea, and I mean, I, I, I like it too as an idea that you know that your body is connected to this pencil, and you're sort of bleeding the words onto the page. When I was in graduate school at Columbia, I got a typewriter for the first time and learned how to type because I felt I needed to do that. I resisted, I think, because it was something that girls were supposed to do and I didn't want to be that kind of girl. <laughs> but I learned <laughs> to type. And once I did, I loved the divorce from my body that I felt looking at the text on the page. I felt it gave me a kind of objectivity that I really didn't have bleeding the words out. So we have exactly the opposite relationship to typing. But you see, then after <laughs> after I write it out by hand, uh, you then know, you I go it. I go over and over and over, and then I think, all right, the paragraph is maybe finished now. I turn around and I type it up, and then I look at it with the same objective eye that you talk about. No, no, I know. And then I start attacking that, and I change that. Um, right. So I, it's it's a series of steps. Right, more, but more you than. use you you use a manual typewriter, not a, a yes, and that's habit. I I believe that that's yeah. habit because it doesn't really make sense because you could type it straight into a computer after you do the handwriting, but you don't do that because you're stuck in your ways. No, I I used the computer for a while <laughs> and it hurt my hands. I I I, I didn't like <laughs> the feel when I type. I'm building up the muscles in my fingers. So. <laughs> Your strong seems, fingers. Seems <laughs> <laughs> what a pain. <laughs> Muscular, <laughs> muscular fingers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a gym class. So, yes. <laughs> so she, class. yeah. So, Siri, do you still think in that? And I quote: "Morning brain is the best brain." Yes. Oh. So, when I was young, I did write at night. Um, when I was a student, uh, that changed. Um, I think with a, a more routine uh, life. But I still, I'm up early in the morning and those first hours at my desk um, are by far the most lucid. And I can feel when I'm beginning to lose the clarity that I have around one o'clock. So if, if I'm say, you know, 6.30 or seven, if I'm at my desk and then I work into the very early afternoon, I can feel a kind of blur. <laughs> In my mind coming over me, but yeah, those first hours they're always like a cloud. <laughs> you see, but for me, it's a little different. Um, yeah, often the morning is very productive, but uh, a good part of the time I struggle with something, and then I take a break in the middle of the day, maybe have a sandwich or a little little lunch, and then I get back to it, and then I'm able to fix it all. I, I, I've figured out what was causing me so much trouble earlier in the day. That's happened a lot. So um, I think, uh, again, I, I, I seem to have two phases in a work day. Um, if I have a really good early part of the day, then I usually end earlier than I, I would when I don't. Yes. Yeah. So I'm talking seriously, uh, to write is like a physical, physical exercise. Yeah, I think it is, right? And um, one can get physically exhausted after an intense day of, of writing, um, which is uh, funny, but you know, there, there is no difference between mind and body, right? Uh, <laughs> that we are embodied beings. And um, that kind of what we think of as mental labor is definitely um, part of our, you know, embodied subjectivity so yes you get really physically tired it's like running a race well i i can say siri and i both work very very hard every day mm -hmm. and uh most of the time we're pretty exhausted by the end of that day <laughs> yeah. and in the evenings uh we tend to just lie like lumps on the sofa and watch old movies just to just to clear our after heads. dinner after, after dinner. dinner we eat we do we eat, we eat we, yeah we make something <laughs> to eat and then and then we often just watch something and yeah. and uh and it's a very strange but we're i think too exhausted i'm too exhausted even to read at that point i read in the afternoons yeah so in fact i i never read at night 
Yeah, and uh, it's glorious black and white movies, old movies. Awesome. Uh, awesome. awesome. Yeah. We, we, old movies. We're very fond of old movies. Yeah, it's a kind of uh, of uh, happiness. So yeah. happiness, yeah. happiness. It's a, a kind of happiness. Black and white movies. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, especially when they're good. <laughs> Yeah, good, good, good comedies from the 1930s. Hollywood comedies were very fond of some of those. So uh, what is your uh, definition of uh, success in literature? Oh, you can answer that. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I, I've never even <laughs> thought of it in those terms. Uh, I guess success would be... Um, Uh, being able to to write the next thing, I, I, I suppose. Um, um, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Uh, certainly, what the outside world says is not success because people have all kinds of opinions. Um, it's hard to know. I mean, I don't even listen to anything anymore because the, the contradictions are so intense. Um, I suppose the one thing that makes me happy about my writing life here in the United States is that all my books are in print. I think hmm. that's the depressing thing. If 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 you write a yeah, book and then it disappears and, and the people can't find it anymore, that's 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 not such a happy situation. But the fact that my books from 30 that. years ago you can still find in the store, that makes me feel good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah lost yeah. books. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, one of the sadder aspects of culture is if you start thinking about uh, writers that we, we don't even know who may have been lost because of, you know, neglect. Uh, no one was really able to see what the person was doing. Uh, there are many examples of, of course, women, uh, people of color uh, who have been just swept out of the way and then rediscovered uh, years later. Uh, so we need to be, I think, very careful about the idea of canons. You know, what what is great, you know, with the capital G and uh to understand that those canons change and they're also made um, often by people who occupy positions of power in the culture and um, who are eager for exclusive rather than inclusive, you know, lists of great books. Um, and as a woman, I can say uh, I have discovered uh, writers who have been, you know, mocked or just forgotten, uh, who have meant a lot to me. I mean, the primary example is Margaret Cavendish, the Duchess of Newcastle. Um, I think one of the great natural philosophers of the 17th century. And uh, I just, you know, I discovered her quite late in my life by reading 17th century natural philosophy. Her name was mentioned, I went there and um, she's become terribly important to my thinking. So I think some of your books will be uh, classics of the future, American <laughs> classics. Nice, you think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. I think it's well. We'll take that. We'll be dead, so we won't have to worry about no. it. <laughs> <laughs> really think about it. Oh, uh, that's nice of you to say. So, Paul, what do you remember of Buenos Aires? Oh, well. I think the first time I was there, it was uh, 2002, and it was yeah. during a tremendous financial crisis. Mm -hmm. All the banks were shut down. And um, I, I found it remarkable how people were coping with this catastrophe in very inventive ways. I, I was just so intrigued by the way people started bartering. You know, I'll give you... French lessons, if you take care of my daughter, you know, three hours a day or something, just people exchanging services mm -hmm. in order to, to survive. Um, and there was a great sense of humor in the people too. Um, it was 
sometimes hilarious. And I, I found it very, very moving. I remember Siri, we were taken to a tango place. All right. And the <laughs> tango dancer got a big crush on Siri. And he said, you know, I'll give you anything except money. I can't do that. <laughs> 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 that was fun. It's true. So that's my most vivid memory of first being there. And then other memories, I've been there several times. Um, I think it's the light. I, there's something beautiful about the light of Buenos Aires. And um, that's 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 the next thing that, that comes to me. And then the third thing is the food, which I really like a lot. And um, and then on and on and on. And then the, the, the friends we've made there and the contacts we've had, uh, I've, I've enjoyed tremendously, um, you know, the, uh, wonderful uh, people that have become dear friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Siri, any kind of memory of Buenos Aires? Yeah, well, I have to say it's one of the few places in the world um, New York might also qualify, but not to the same degree where psychoanalysis really counts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where you know you can get into a cab and have a conversation with a cab driver who's in psychoanalysis uh, so with all patients I, I i think it's pretty all wonderful uh my long-standing interest um in freud and ongoing uh many different uh analysts uh i actually just gave the opening lecture for the international psychoanalytic associations Zoom conference, um, and uh, and I think um, yeah that that psychoanalysis thrives in Buenos Aires, and I appreciate that. So in two thousand and two, I was very young, but I was in your uh, seminar about um, uh, movies and literature. Oh, Paul uh, Malva, Museo de Arte yes. Latinoamericano de Buenos Aires. Yes. I have a terrific memory about it. Yeah. Good, good, good. It was 2002 I did that? Yeah, so long yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. 20, almost 20 years ago. So, yeah. yeah. Crazy, crazy. Crazy. Like uh, yesterday to me. We, well. Yeah. So, um, here are my, my final uh, questions. So, Siri, when, when did you feel, if ever, most uh, powerful or empowered like a female writer? Oh, um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it gradually came to me that um, When I understood, let me change this around. When I understood uh, that the kind of misogyny that women writers do face uh, is not personal. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, once you are able to contextualize um, some of the you know, unhappy incidents that can happen as a woman writer, uh, then you are liberated from the stupidity. Because I think what happens is that women have a tendency to take this on, or uh, certainly I did. You know, why is this person cruel? Why am I, you know, being treated in this particular way? And once I understood that many of those episodes had nothing to do with me, they simply had to do with, you know, my gender, uh, that was extremely liberating. And I think it allowed me to dispose of that pain very efficiently. Um, can I say something yeah. about you also? Yeah. You know, I, 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 I believe Siri. Go ahead. I, I, do, I believe Siri is a genius. And I think <laughs> she is doing things that no one else in the world is doing because she has, oh, I don't know, a double or a triple life. I mean, she's written these beautiful, powerful novels, which alone would be enough to make her, you know, recognized as one of the great writers of today. But then she's done all this intellectual work of such 
blazing originality and depth and erudition, plus all this writing on art, which is magnificent. So for me, every time I see Siri recognized in the world, that's, I feel so proud. I feel so <laughs> good. And so, for example, no, watch it, watching I'm Siri. Well, watching <laughs> Siri give the annual Freud lecture in Vienna before hundreds and hundreds of, of, of psychiatrists and psych psychoanalysts, or two years ago in Spain, Siri getting the Princess of Asturias Prize. Mm -hmm. Which and, he and, got too. And delivering. Yeah. The no, no, but it was it was remarkable. I just felt so happy for you to see a whole auditorium up on its feet clapping for Siri um, after she had made this beautiful speech directed to the little princess who is now in charge of the prize. And um, so I, it just makes me feel good when, when people recognize her and give her the honors that she's due. What a, what a proud uh, husband. <laughs> I know. It's a proud husband. Very well, nice. it's, it's very nice. You know, I yes. have to say, I did marry the right guy. You certainly so, did. <laughs> so, well, my, my last, the last one, my last question is about marriage. Uh, so, is being married to another writer harder or different or uh, the most in professions or just a happy coincidence? Uh, well, you want to say something? Well, I think I, I think for us, no, I think for us, this has uh, forged a really long-standing dialogue over many, many years. Right, the fact that we were doing the same thing, and um, you know, I was twenty-six when I met Paul, and you were thirty-four. Four, yeah, we, uh, we had just turned twenty-six and thirty-four mm -hmm. a few weeks, be days before. Yeah. And um, and I, th you know, we were uh, linked by the fact that we were passionate about literature and were both writing. So, you were Paul was working on his first prose book, *The Invention of Solitude*, when we met. So, really, our literary lives. I mean, I had published a few poems in magazines. That was, you know, what I had done, uh, and so. Really, the whole course of our literary lives has been uh, together. Yeah. Well, I had that previous life, but I, I was a poet poem, and, and published a, poems. Yeah, and, and, and a wrote, translator yes. and an essayist, but um, nevertheless, as a prose writer, I found, I my, I found myself yeah. during that time. Um, uh, I think um, it's, 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 it's been a great advantage, I think, to both of us to have each other, because I give Siri everything I write for her comments, and she gives me everything she writes for my comments. Absolutely. And nothing gets out of the house without <laughs> the approval of the other, you know. It's called in-house editor. Now, <laughs> I, I must say. What a privilege, yeah. yeah. Now, I just have this new book being published, you know, on Stephen Crane, um, and, at the end, I, I have acknowledgments. I, you know, thank the people who helped. And then last paragraph, I say for Siri. And, you know, I'd never been able to write this. There was never an appropriate place. And I just said, you know, Siri has been the first and most important reader of all my books for the past 40 years, all my work. And then I said, you know, people say that writers should never get married to each other because... And then I dot, 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 because they can't live under the same roof together, period. And I end it by saying they are wrong. <laughs> and that's how the book ends uh, with that. They are wrong. Yes. <laughs> so Siri, Paul, thanks for this Thank uh, conversation. You. It was a beautiful, beautiful moment. Thank you very much. You are welcome here in Buenos Aires. Um, we'll we'll get there. We're gonna we'll get there. I someday, hope before someday. we die. Yes, yes. yes. I, I I hope so. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Take Adios. care. Take bye care, bye. Nicholas. Bye bye.